Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, CGDC, the first talk. I'm so excited to be leading it off and uh, grateful to be here. Um, looks like got a lot of emojis, so apparently people can hear me. If you can hear me, can you give me that little, uh, the little guy with the sunglasses, the superb emoji? Everybody's listening, great, sounds good. Okay, so my name is Jack. I am a tabletop designer. If you're a tabletop designer, will you show me some love? Give me a heart in the emojis here if there are tabletop designers out there. If you're a video game designer, will you show me uh, show me that, that wow emoji, okay? Video game designers, give me a wow. All right, nice. So we got some video game designers, we got some tabletop folks, that's awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, of course, I'm, so I'm leading a workshop called Brain to Table, how to make your ideas into games and I think that uh, there may be some of us out there who don't have published games. If you have never published a game before, if you would consider yourself maybe a noob or something of that stripe, would you show me the sunglass emoji? Give me that, that little superb guy. Nice. Okay, so we have some new designers out there. If you're a seasoned designer, show those noobs some love. Give them the heart emoji. Yeah, okay, so we've got some seasoned designers. We've got some new designers. The purpose of my talk here is to get our ideas on the table. And if you're a video game designer, it's to get your idea into the digital platform so people can play it, right? So we can get started on the testing and the iteration cycle to get something published, to get something out there in the world. Ultimately, as Christians, right, we all share the Great Commission. We are trying to share with people about Jesus, baptizing in his name, and ultimately spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen, right? So. If we're going to do that, we got to put stuff out into the world that can make that happen. All right. So um, my perspective here is to inspire us, to encourage us, to get us kind of moving and get our creative juices flowing this morning. So we are going to have uh, a little bit of an interactive and exciting workshop this morning. But first of all, I'm going to, to just gab. I'm going to talk for a little bit. I'm going to introduce myself and tell you why I'm qualified to tell you and teach about rapid prototyping and how that's kind of worked out in my life. So I just want to show you some photos, kind of help you get acquainted with me, give us a little bit of a theological backing, like why should we rapidly prototype things? And then we'll get into creating a game prototype together. So whether you're a video game designer or you're a tabletop designer, ultimately, it starts with the table. A lot of video games start in paper prototyping. And even if it's not in paper prototyping, you're doing something on a very simple platform, uh, you know, designing a, a, a sketch or a storyboard or something like that. So everything starts uh, from some very simple design and the complexity is added later. OK, so we start very simple. We move to complex. That's just an obvious um, sort of uh, progression. And that's kind of how God worked in his creative process as well. Right. Separated things, separated things, separated things and then filled them up. And then gave Adam the task of naming all the animals, right? So um, first of all, I uh, just want to introduce you to me a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, just show you uh, a little bit about my personal game design journey and tell you a little bit about me. So uh, let's see here. All right, everybody see that? Give me a thumbs up. Give me some sort of emoji of any kind if you can just see my screen. Right now. Okay, great. Everything is working on our platform. So uh, I developed a game starting in January of last year. Um, it's called New Kingdom. It's a tabletop game. It's my first, my first one that I'm really seeking to publish. Uh, I've got three designs kind of in process at various stages, but New Kingdom is in that, that uh, beta stage. We're doing some blind pay, play testing, pre-marketing. It's really exciting. It's about uh, living a life anticipating the New Kingdom. That started as a note on my phone. You can see I wrote it up at 4.32 p.m. or whatever. And I took a screenshot as soon as I wrote it because I thought, ah, I'm starting something here, right? So it started as a note on my phone. That's it. That's all I had for a game design. I had support cards, light player cards, dark player cards. And ultimately, I went, wait a minute. I don't want people playing as demons. I want people to fight them and destroy them, right? So I started thinking about like, okay, well, let's do maybe a deck builder. I love deck building games, so I thought that would be easy. And let's do uh, competitive, uh, solo and cooperative. We'll do everything, right? Of course, like this is all a high level design and I, I whittled it down to something that was actually workable. But note where it started. Very, very simple. Just a note on my phone. 
which turned into a text to my best friend, Weston, who is also a Christian and a very creative person. He's a teacher. I said, dude, I have an idea for a card game. I'm going to work on it and pitch it to you. And he said, let's go. And uh, here's kind of my, my pitch for that original game, right? It started in a text message. It doesn't have to start with reaching out to a publisher or going to a game convention. It can start with a text message to a friend. Like, this is game design at its very first step, okay? This happened while I was in Texas with my wife. So this is my wife, Lindsay. She's my biggest supporter. If you're married out there, give me a, give me a heart emoji. If you're, uh, if you're single or, uh, you know, in some other stage of life, give me a, a hand clap emoji, right? Just love to see kind of what the audience is like out there. Um, but this is my wife. She's my biggest supporter, my biggest friend. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about uh, is two, um, I'll be talking about two things that can uh, move your designs forward. And we'll get to that at the end. Um, but uh, one of the biggest things is allies. Who is going to help you? Lindsay was my help from the very beginning. I had my friend Weston. And my wife, Lindsay, I knew I had allies on this journey, right? If we think about the, the heroic journey, right? It, every good quest starts with a party forming. And so when I got on my game design journey, I formed a party. I had my biggest supporter and my wife and my friend Weston who was helping give me the push, right? This of course happened during COVID. We were in Texas at a hotel room. There wasn't a whole lot of activity going on. So uh, what did I do? I stayed in the hotel room while my wife went to this conference. She was at a work conference. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, just kind of hung out at this, this thing. We had some, uh, very specific events that we were going to, I had already seen the information from this conference. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work on that game design in the hotel room and I'll meet you at night. And my wife said, absolutely. I'd love to see your game design. That's a good ally for one. You need to have people like that who are saying, let's move your game design forward. Okay. So I got home, I had written all of these cards in my notebook and I just, typed away, printing them up on label paper. I peeled that label paper off and I stuck it to some blank poker cards I bought off of Amazon. I bought some blank tokens from Amazon. And uh, within a couple of hours, uh, you know, maybe like three or four hours of painstakingly cutting out and sticking sh uh, um, shipping labels or address labels on the blank poker cards, I had a game, right? Lindsay and I played it. it took us like four hours and we went, that was ridiculously long but it was also kind of fun so we started working on the iteration process we had an immediate prototype and then we turned it into something over time uh here's the first prototype i printed through the game crafter i started working with their uh, software component studio i knew nothing about it sat down i learned how to do it, it took me a whole saturday i developed some cards they looked terrible but they printed up and we were able to play new kingdom with more people and much quicker because we had some actual working design. We had some icons, we had things applied to it, the components started to improve. And so I had something I could actually work with. Fast forward, I refined that prototype, add some more iconography. And the whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking, how do I get this to the table with as many people as possible? So here's me taking that prototype down to California with our friends. We spread it out on the table and we were thinking, man, the setup for this game is ridiculous. We need to refine it. But all along, I'm making new prototypes, making iterations, moving this thing forward. And it starts by just getting things done, right? We have to move through the prototyping process to get it to the table. So this game was, uh, it was a doozy. It was like three and a half hours. It's the first time I'd played with four players. And uh, at the end of it, Molly and Hayden, our friends there went, wow, that was a fun game, Jack. Um, it's way too long. <laughs> so we keep working on it. We keep refining it the whole time. I'm working as a pastor. So I'm a pastor. I'm a church planter. You all probably want to know, why is this guy qualified to tell me anything about game design? The thing is, I am a, a serial entrepreneur. I've worked for two churches. I planted this church seven years ago. And uh, this church in the last two years with COVID, we were in a large theater downtown in Spokane called the Bing Theater, this historic sort of venue. And uh, COVID moved us out of it. And we said, you know what, let's start planting house churches. So we did. Now we have a hybrid model where we still have the church that we planted seven years ago and it's growing and developing, but we're supporting other churches in the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene area, helping new leaders emerge and take over and raise up communities all around the city. So church planting is um, 
something that's near and dear to my heart and starting new things is something that's near and dear to my heart as well. So the whole time I'm working on game design, I'm also planting house churches with my co-pastor Boris and preaching on Sundays and doing all of these other things and attending to uh, life with my wife and my two wiener dogs, right? So eventually we get to this place where we have a pretty commercial looking product. We got something that is proto that, you know, I could send out, put it on a YouTube video. I could do, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, work on this prototype here and start to promote it, enter it into, um, uh, enter it into contests and whatnot, get some real feedback. And I started uh, limping my way into the game design community, meeting people, developing connections and saying, you know what, I'm no longer a wannabe, I'm a game designer. I have a game that I have designed and I am taking that to market. I'm gonna take it to market, we'll see where it goes. But the first step is getting started. You have to get started so you can move forward. And we'll, we'll talk about how we do that. Um, but just like with uh, church planting, we started the church seven years ago, we had 30 people. We now have over a hundred people and then we've got this network of five house churches, right? So things grow incrementally and they grow slowly if we're cooperative with God. We let God work in and through us. As Paul says in Ephesians, we are his workmanship made in Christ Jesus with good works for us in advance to do. We have stuff to do. In Galatians, Paul says, keep pressing forward because if we do not give up at the right time, we will reap a harvest. And in 1 Corinthians, one of my life verses that I think about all the time is 1558. In regards to the resurrection, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is never in vain. Keep pressing forward on that creative idea. Keep pushing into it. Whether it's small or large, doesn't matter for the kingdom of God. What matters is our forward movement. It matters that we keep striving for Christ, right? We keep working on the things he has given us to do. Okay, so I want to keep going with my story here a little bit. Still a pastor, right? I developed this prototype. Here we're sending boxes off with Operation Christmas Child, having our kids pray over them. I took on the, the role not only of associate pastor in my in my role and network pastor for house churches, but also as children's director. So here I'm working with the kids. We're working prayer into our services. And it was about that time I realized, man, this game has to be applicable to kids. So I developed a version of my game that's a little bit simpler that can um, uh, be uh, done by uh, kids and family members. So um, I put together this, this game over the, the course of the holidays. I just took a blank white box I got from the game crafter at some point, And, uh, I, I used those same blank poker cards I used a year ago to start creating new kingdom. I printed out some tokens on cardstock, right? I just developed print and play files that you, if you look at these, I mean, you have to get a sense for how ridiculous these components are for this little game. They are Two side, they're not two sided. They're two pieces of paper that are printed and cut out and stuck together with scotch tape. Okay. They're not fancy, but I got this game to the table and we started playing it over the holidays because I said, you know what? I'm going to have a captive audience of my brother in law and his kids. Um, and I started developing these, uh, this, this game with just those same blank poker cards, some printing labels, some paper and ink. And that's, that's it. That's all it takes to get started. So start working on Gateway Edition, came up with something pretty commercial within a month now. You know, I've kind of worked up on, uh, worked my skills to a point where I can develop things quickly in Component Studio, printed up these cards. We've got a pretty professional looking prototype, entered into a competition, got some votes, got some feedback, all helpful. And uh, this has been shared around the country. I've been shipping them off to people. We're blind play testing. We're really refining this a lot. Scott has a copy at his school, right? There he is enjoying uh, his reception of New Kingdom. Um, and uh, all the while, in the meantime, we had a baby. So my wife and I had uh, Ruby. <clears throat> She's uh, now six months old. She loves playing Wingspan with us and Castle Panic and everything else. Uh, still taking care of my two wiener dogs. There's Phoebe, and then there's Tigger. And uh, we have a pretty full life. We've got a lot going on, but it's just about taking small steps forward every day. Here's a picture of the full family, me and my wife, Lindsay, my sister-in-law, Abby, who lives in the basement, and Ruby. So as I go, I'm acquiring new party members, right? They're joining my party. They're they're helping me out. 
Uh, Abby's super, uh, super flexible. She watches Ruby a lot, sometimes late at night, so I can get to work on game design. And uh, here's New Kingdom now. Here's what it looks like after a year's worth of work, reprototyping iterations. We're working on more professional things. We get some, uh, uh, we get some artists involved, some graphic designers, and we start to refine the process even more. Uh, meanwhile, Ruby's still my assistant. She doesn't get much work done, but she helps inspire me, keep me going. And uh, it just leads us to getting more people to the table. My brother-in-law, my friend Sean from Chicago, you have people uh, getting involved, playing the game, having fun, right? Liz won last night. We were playing Gateway Edition. She's like, I don't know, beginner's luck, right? The whole point of all of this is just so that we can get our games to the table. So how do we start? Um, I want to start with a little theological background for rapid prototyping. And it comes from Acts chapter 2. So in Acts, this really... Uh, important thing happens. The Holy Spirit is promised to the believers and they're, they're waiting with Jesus. And then there's this ascension in Acts 2, 9, it says, after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. The disciples are sitting around with Jesus. They're kind of like, okay, what's next? He says, you are going to go out uh, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And Jesus is standing with them. And he's just taken up into the clouds and the disciples, <laughs> it says, while he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Translation, uh, get to work, guys. <laughs> the disciples are all standing around and they're like, well, what do we do without Jesus? And he says, I told you, the spirit's coming. You're going to spread the gospel. I've already told you about all of this, right? So they're standing looking up into heaven. These angels appear, these men in white robes, and they say, what are you doing? Get moving. And so what did they do? They go back to Jerusalem. They kind of wait around. Pentecost happens within a chapter. And then Peter and John, boom, they're out there. They're spreading the gospel. And Paul comes along just a few chapters later and spreads the gospel even further to the ends of the earth. But they needed a little bit of a push. They needed somebody to say, hey, Stop staring up into heaven and let's get going. As long as you have an idea, an idea is not nothing. An idea is something powerful. But until it is put into action, it is always just an idea. It is always just an idea. And so I'm going to share, you, share a couple of principles with you that have helped me get going in life. Um, prior to working in game design, I was working in the business world. And uh, in the business world, my role, I worked for an e-commerce company doing logistics for years. Um, I had an opportunity at some point to step into first to market stuff. And primarily what I was working on, I was working with an FBA seller, an Amazon FBA seller, one of the biggest in the country. And I uh, got approached by Walmart and they said, hey, we want to start e-commerce. And I said, okay. Let's get started with that. So me and my partner, Tyler, we got them started and we showed them the information that we knew. And now Walmart has this robust third party seller e-commerce marketplace. But it started with just Tyler and I and a few other people at our company and Walmart. And, um, you know, it wasn't perfect. There were tons of errors along the way, but we got started with them. And just like with church planting, it was like, man, we got to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That's a big task. Well, let's start by telling our friends about Jesus and see if they get excited about coming around the table with us and joining us on mission. Let's get people in, activated in their neighborhoods. And maybe that could turn into communities, right? That's how the house church thing started. All of it starts with a very simple principle. Get moving. This is my first little nugget for you. If you have a journal or if you have a notepad on your phone like me, right? Who has a, if you have a journal or a notepad out there, give me a, give me a little clap. Let me see your, your emojis. Who's taking notes? Okay. I'm going to occasionally say things that might be helpful for you. Here's one. The first one is get your idea out of your head and onto the table. Okay. Get your idea out of your head and onto the table. That doesn't matter what it looks like. It could be sketches. It could be a notebook. It could be Google Keep. It could be Google Drive. It could be the note phone on the note app on your phone, Evernote. 
All of you have great ideas of places that you're caching your ideas, your mechanics, your themes, everything. Put those out onto the table. As long as they're in your head, they're nothing. We're standing up, gazing into heaven. The gospel is not going to spread that way. It spreads by getting active and moving out into the world. So that's the first thing. Here's the second principle. It's an acronym, five steps. It was from a, a well-known Christian leader who inspired me and got us moving in our church plan. So um, the principle is this. It's GETMO. G-E-T-M-O. I'll throw that in the chat for you. G-E-T-M-O. Write it down. Put it on your wall, whatever. Write it in your game de game design journal, wherever you have it. Getmo. What does Getmo mean? It means good enough to move on. <laughs> good enough to move on. This is the principle that I apply to prototyping, whether it's in the business world with a complex operation, like bringing something like third-party sellers onto Walmart, or whether it was in church planting, in starting a new church in the Spokane community, or in developing house churches in neighborhoods, or in building a prototype. Here's the deal. I want you to think about this. When I was a master's student in college, I got busy. I had family. I had, um, uh, I had youth groups that I was leading. I was preaching at church every once in a while. And I was starting to juggle a lot of balls. I had to keep balls in the air, right? Because I was I was starting to learn how to be a juggler as a master's student. Some of you are students, you know this. You have to attend to your homework, but you have to attend to your friends, your family, everything else. Good, good enough to move on. Getmo is a principle that will save you. Because uh, here's the deal. We can't be perfect. There was one person who was perfect. And he hung on, on the cross for us, right? There's only one person that can do these things perfectly. And even if your job is as an end developer in the video game industry, and you're handed a project and basically your job is, let's make this perfect. The reality is when you come down to the deadline or you come to the end of the project, there's always going to be something you could have done more, should have done more, are supposed to do more. But the reality is we will just never, ever get everything perfect. And once you realize that, Gitmo becomes a way of life. You say, okay, this is good enough to move on. I can be proud of it. I'm not telling you to do shoddy work. I'm telling you to do great work, right? Do important and excellent work. But at some point, no, I can spend the same amount of time getting something from zero to 90% as I could from getting something from 90% to 100%. I'm going to say that again. You could spend the same amount of time getting something from 0% to 80 to 90% as you would from getting it from 90% to 100%. Perfection is the enemy of good. We have to learn Gitmo. We have to learn that sometimes things are just good enough to move on. Like I'm a preacher and for sermons, I want them to be excellent. I want them to be perfect. But the reality is they're never going to be perfect. There's always going to be something that's like, man, I should have, I should have done that differently, or I should have said that, or this scripture would have been perfect there. But Sunday is coming, and a sermon has to be preached. And so at some point, I have to be done, because I have a wife and a daughter, and I have things that need to be done as well as preaching. And all of you are in that boat, whether you're a pastor, you're a first-time designer, you're a high school student, you're a master's student, all of us have things that we need to do, and we need to learn that. We, we just need to get things started so that they can be made better. That's the whole idea with prototyping. So we're going to use the principle of Gitmo, and we're going to use this theological backing of not staring up into heaven, but in moving forward. So moving forward with Gitmo, we are going to create a prototype right now. So whether you're a video game designer or a tabletop designer, I want to hear in the chat right now, what are your favorite types of games? Just chat them out there. Show me what you what you've got. What are your favorite types of games? Square Enix games, co-op games, okay? Fighting games, MMOs, third-party action adventure, co-op, RPG, RPG, racing, co-op, fantasy, adventure. Okay, nice. Strategy, RPG, RPG, real-time strategy, strategy, co-op. Adventure party games, racing, co-op, multiplayer, dodgeball. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Walking simulators. Okay. <laughs> Race simulators, anything Zelda-like, point and click, multiplayer, dexterity. Okay. Great. So 
I want you to note, as you're thinking about your favorite type of games, you're already getting started on the creative process. Okay, I like these types of games. This is something I might move forward with. If you're a game designer, you're already thinking in your head, all right, man, I would really like to work on a co-op game, or I'd really like to work on a two-player game, or I'd really like to work on a fantasy game, an RPG. To build prototypes, we are going to focus on three elements, okay? And they're based on three very simple questions. Now, I'm not a game design theorist, okay? So there are lots of game design theory out there. I've read a lot of it. I've listened to many podcasts. But ultimately, we just need to concern ourselves with three questions when it comes to building a prototype. One, what is this game about? I want to create a game. What game, what is this game about? Two, how do you play? And three, what do I need to play this game? What is this game about? That's theme. How do you play this game? That's mechanics. And then how, what are we playing this game with? That's components. Or if you're in the digital medium, if you're a video game designer, that's your UX, UI. That's your, uh, that's, that's all of the backend dev work that goes into developing the game loop. It's the engine that you're using to run your game. What, or it could be the coding language. Um, all of those things are what you need to actually play your game. So in, uh, the, in the sort of spirit of simplicity, I'm going to create some polls and we are going to vote and then we're going to create a, uh, we are going to create a board game prototype together. If you're a video game designer, just imagine your paper prototyping for a video game. It's the exact same process, right? So uh, here's our poll. Our poll is, what is this game about? Okay, so in this, we're thinking about theme. And I saw some really great ones out there. We have fantasy, we have racing. Okay. We have Let's see, show me those themes. What themes do we like? Murder, mystery, what else do we have? We have dodgeball, I kind of like that theme. That's cool, that's a cool theme. A lot of people bringing up dodgeball. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. We've got uh, open world exploration, that might be more mechanics. Roguelike, that's, a, that's definitely a mechanic. Square Enix games, what else? Dodgeball. The RPG already, right? Okay, RPG. I'm gonna put RPG in the, the realm of mechanics. So let's let's keep thinking theme. Like if we're gonna put a skin on this game, if this is you know Monopoly and we put dodgeball. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna test this theory and make sure that we're right here. But let's go fantasy. We've got racing, and we've got here dodgeball. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's see on this poll. I need your votes. Can all of you get in there and vote? Oh, fantasy is taking it. Come on. Come on, dodgeball. Let's see if you can do it. We're playing a racing game right now, actually. It's kind of funny. Fantasy, dodgeball, fantasy, fantasy. Okay. I'm going to close voting down to 10 o'clock. The top of this minute. Let's keep going. Let's see what we got. Fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. Dodgeball, racing, fantasy. Okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 closed. Okay, so we're doing a fantasy game. All right, great. So this this game is fantasy oriented, all right? So um, we think, you know, what D&D &D classes, maybe something like that. Uh, let's refine this theme a little bit. Throw out some fantasy themes for me in the chat. Um, you know, let's get a little bit more focused. Are we talking space, urban? Are we talking medieval, castles and dungeons, right? Okay, what else? Pirates. Ancient Egypt. <laughs> Biblical age, of course. Pilgrim's Progress. 
pirates and ninjas, dragons in space. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see. I'm still working on a couple here. Um, okay. Okay, I think I think this poll I think this poll is ready to go. Let's see. I'm gonna show this poll on stage. We're gonna race. Okay, vote on your themes. Show me what you like. What do you like? Do you like dragons and castles? Do you like pirates? Do you like fantasy dodgeball? How about space? How about biblical times? Let's go. Okay, I'm, I'm closing this down at 32. 32 minutes when it gets there for me. I'm, I'm watching my watching my speaker time right now. Got 30 seconds. Let's keep going. What do you like? Dragons and castles. Pirates. Fantasy dodgeball is winning. Yes, I love this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. Biblical times. <laughs> Biblical times. Can you imagine? Peter and Thomas. Dodgeball. And you got Judas in the corner, maybe. <laughs> what do we have going on here? You got Matthew counting the ratio of balls hit balls on the table. Okay, so we're going to stop here. So we'll close close the poll. Okay, so here's a secret that I didn't tell you. You can all see the poll results. We got 54 votes. Fantasy Dodgeball is the game that we're making. Okay, <laughs> we're going to do Fantasy Dodgeball. But to refine Fantasy Dodgeball, who are the teams? Who are the players? Well, here's a concept that I learned from one of the most creative people I've ever met, a former pastor of mine. He said this. He said, and we know this, from Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. But here's the deal. I learned this from Stan Lee, actually, when he was talking about Spider-Man. When Stan Lee talked about Spider-Man, he said, how about we take a superhero and make him a teenager, and we give him real-life problems, and he uh, has spider powers. And he took this to a publisher and thought, man, I got a really good idea here. And his publisher said, uh, no, people don't like spiders. People don't like teenagers. Like, they won't be able to relate to a teenager. Right? And they, they don't want their heroes to have actual problems. That's so not going to work. Stanley published this anyway in a, a magazine. He did like a little aside on Spider-Man. And it became this incredibly popular piece. And later his publisher came to him and said, hey, uh, remember that Spider-Man idea you had? Yeah, let's, uh, let's run with that, actually. Um, and the whole idea is that my pastor presented to me and what Stanley kind of brought up to me is something very simple about creativity. Derivative plus derivative equals original. Okay, that's something you can write down. If you're stuck creatively and you're thinking, I don't know where to go from here. Derivative plus derivative equals original. So we have a fantasy category, right? And we put it with dodgeball. We have two derivative ideas and we're turning them into something that is original. And that's why it resonated with you. You like this because the theme is not just one thing. It's two things together. It's something original here. Okay, so um, maybe we'll take, uh, um, <laughs> we could even take this and throw in a third theme. We could do biblical times dodgeball. How about that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're going to run with this fantasy dodgeball idea. Okay. Um, so fantasy dodgeball is kind of our theme. We're, we're going to do sort of like, uh, castles, dragons, all of that kind of stuff. We could even throw in some biblical time things like Nephilim or, or angels, right? And bring those things into it. Derivative plus derivative equals original. Okay. So we have a fantasy dodgeball game. Look at that. We already created something. This is an idea. Now we got to bring it to the table. Now, here's the thing about, uh, bringing ideas to the table. There are a couple of different ways we can go about this. And games can start from any of these three places. We don't have to start with theme. It's just y'all are creative people. We're thinking about games all the time. We have theme at the forefront of our mind. 
but you can start from mechanics. You can start from a place of components. I actually just listened to a great podcast about component first game design on the board game design lab last week. You could start with anything you want, but um, we're just starting with theme as kind of a, a general sort of beginning. Okay. We have what the game is about. Secondly, the next question is, how is this game played? I want you to put on your thinking caps for mechanics and tell me in the chat, we're creating a board game here. What do you do in dodgeball? How does that even look mechanically? Are we using, um, well, I'll just let you, let you throw it out there. What do we got? VR. Okay, yeah, yes. For you video game designers, absolutely. VR is an option. Dice, okay. Split board with teams on each side. Okay, marbles for dice. Okay, ooh, ooh. Jesus Juke is a type of powered up dodge. <laughs> nice. Grid board. Okay, paper clips. Okay. Uh, okay, awesome. Dice, dice rolling. Okay, so this is like, okay, cards for superpower throws, mini flags, grid versus hex board. I like capture the flag. Okay, so we are. We're going to uh, refine this down just to um, how is this game played. So let's, let's, look at, um, let's look at mechanics here. Okay, I got some great ideas from this. We're going to create a poll here and see how we play this. How do we play this? So how do we play this is in the realm of mechanics. Okay, so we asked the question, uh, what are we doing? Uh, what is this game about? Now we're asking, how do we play this? Okay, so I'm going to show the results instantly, and we are going to vote on this right now. So you guys all brought this, uh, you guys kind of brought this up to my attention. Um, okay, how do we play this game? What are the mechanics? Tactical combat, right? We're moving on grids and hexes. Um, and we're positioning and maneuvering ourselves so that we're attacking our opponents. Okay, deck building. We're putting together cards to assemble a, a structure of things that we can we can do when we're dodgeballing. Dice rolling and dice drafting. I like that idea. You have character powers. You uh, power up as you go. You roll dice and you record the results. That's interesting. Pre-constructed decks. You, uh, you use like a TCG sort of format where you uh, buy and assemble cards and decks and you use those. Okay, lots of good ideas here. I'm going to give it about 20 more seconds and we'll see sort of what we do. Dice rolling and drafting is pulling ahead. That's, uh, that's interesting. Tactical combat, deck building, dice rolling, dice drafting. Sweet. Okay, give it another 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, come on, one. Polls closed. Okay, tactical combat. Okay, I'm going to spoil another secret about prototyping to you. I told you that derivative plus derivative equals original, right, when it comes to theme and creativity. Here's a new one. Simple plus simple equals complex. Okay, so when it comes to mechanics, we can come up with something pretty original by smashing two mechanics together, just like what we did with our, um, just like what we did with our theme. However, with a game, we want to be careful not to smash too many things together. We have this out of world complexity that we can never manage. Take a couple of simple ideas like tactical combat, and dice rolling or drafting, and boom, we have a fantasy dodgeball draft, uh, dice drafting, dice rolling, combat system sweet okay so so far we have a we have a dice based fantasy dodgeball game i love the idea okay so uh fantasy dodgeball tactics war of the zions <laughs> nice michael love it uh gloomhaven <laughs> all right google it one of the best board games of all time by most standards okay awesome i love it 
fantasy dodgeball tactics for the Zions. Okay, it already exists. Hey, sometimes this will happen. You have something out there, and uh, it exists. Here's what we can do. We can always retheme it, put biblical characters in there, do, do uh, Christian fantasy dodgeball. How about that? Christian fantasy dodgeball, dice rolling and drafting. Okay, so we got this. What do we need to play this game? This is our final question. How are we doing it? If we are going to build this game, what do we need to do it? Y'all threw out some of these ideas already. You said cards, dice, plastic cards. Components are a great starting place and they can actually move us forward. I just in this, I told you, I just listened to this podcast about this. This guy was saying, you know, uh, games are about play. We start playing with components and bits and then games emerge from that. I just did this with my friend. We created this basketball game using a football called Hike It Ball. And it was super, super fun. A bunch of kids came by the park and said, what are you doing? And I said, we're making games. And they were like, that's awesome. I would never think of using a football for basketball, right? Components can drive game design. But now that we have a fantasy dodgeball dice rolling and drafting game, I want you to think, uh, what do we need to do to play this game? What components do we need? Throw them out there. What do we need on the table? If we're going to play this board game, what do we need? If you're a video game designer, this is where you start thinking about like scripting, game loop. Okay, how do we do this? What languages do I need to know? Um, am I doing 3D, VR, et cetera, et cetera? You need a dodgeball, <laughs> a table, marbles. What could represent a dodgeball? Grid, hex map, die, a board, player pieces, character pieces, huge fluffy dice so they can be used for regular dodgeball later. A bowling ball. <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, I like this, I like this. What else do we have? Die, board, player pieces. It's a huge fluffy dice, D20, a D20 that can be a dodgeball, or D100. Okay, dice to score hits and misses. I have a fluffy D20. Smooth tabletop. Physical tokens for characters, physical tokens to dodge around or hide behind. Decks of cards for different moves and attacks, buffs, debuffs, enemy tokens. Okay, I am going to put together a list of mm, how about three of these components of different things, different uh, configurations. So what do we need to do? Okay, cards. Thank you, guys. I'm just going to say D and B dice. That includes like your D10, D12, D20, whatever. And then we need uh, okay. So we're gonna publish this idea. All right. Show me your votes. No, 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 not that one. We already did that one. Show on stage. Okay. What do we need to play? Vote with me. What do you want to see in this game? You want to see a game board, you want to see cards, standees and stickers to represent the characters, you need a regular dice, you need D and D, your fluffy dice. You know, what do we what do we need here? Okay, I'm going to give this 20 seconds. Keep voting. Throw something out there. You see some particular favorite or something. Give the vote. You say, like, man, this is really essential for this game. You got to have this, Jack. We're going to play fantasy dodgeball, a dice rolling and drafting game. What are you going to do here? You're going to get. Okay. Got five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Poll is closed. Okay, so close the poll. 
here's the deal with components. So uh, I kind of pulled a bait and switch on you when I did the theme and when I did the mechanics and I smashed things together. I'm going to do the exact same thing here with the components because a game can't be based around a single component. We're going to take the four most popular here and we're going to build a game out of it. So we have a board. Obviously, we need a board if we're going to move. We have fluffy dice. And then we got uh, two components here tied at 15.38%. So we're going to use a board. We're going to have fluffy dice. We're going to have D&D &D dice. And we're going to have cards. OK, great. Let's take it to the table. Um, OK, I'm going to write down in my trusty notebook what we're doing here. So we're building a fantasy, a uh, fantasy dodgeball game. We are going to do it in a dice drafting rolling style. Uh, and it's going to be like tactical combat. Uh, and then we are going to do it with uh, these components. We'll have cards. We'll have a board. We will have D&D uh, dice. And we will have fluffy dice, which is one of my favorite ideas ever. <laughs> I love having fl fluffy dice so you can like physically flick them or throw them at people. D&D &D fluffy dice. I love it. Okay. So I have a table behind me. I'm going to show you what it looks like to get started on the prototyping thing. And remember, what's that principle I told you about? It's five things. Get mo, right? Good enough to move on. Look, fantasy dodgeball might not be the most original idea in the entire world. It's great, but we can refine it. We're good enough to move on. We've got a fantasy dodgeball game. We're doing tactical combat with dice. We're going to take it to the table, and we're going to get it good enough to move on. So this game will be playable in the next 10 minutes. Okay, here we go. So i got my table set up here. I've got my components. Here's the deal. You don't need to break the bank on your components. You can spend... 20 bucks at Michael's and pick up bags of beads and some other things or whatever your crafting store is, wherever you're at, Hobby Lobby, you can walk in there and pull, pick up all kinds of things that you could use to create templates. Um, I'm going to tell you a little secret here and show you something. When I first started on the board for New Kingdom, I started with a piece of cardboard from an Amazon box and I drew the card spots on the board. I also later had to refine that design. So I ripped the top off of a pizza box and I wrote the card spots on it, titled it The World, and we started putting cards on that. You don't have to spend anything at all to start working on game design. If we're gonna use little characters and we need to move them in space, rip up a piece of cardboard and put them on your board and you have little player standees. You could write on one, Black Sharpie, you can just say, hey, you know what? We've got a J, we've got Peter, and we've got we've got Peter and we've got Jesus, and they're playing dodgeball, right? You could do that <laughs> if you want. Of course, we're not gonna make Jesus a player character because he would absolutely destroy everybody at dodgeball. Amen? Yeah, great. He was just well, I don't know, would he? That's a good theological, philosophical question. Would Jesus win at dodgeball? Or would he purposefully lose because he emptied himself of the fullness of God? Have that debate around at dinner. That would be more fun with your atheist friends than election. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> here we go. So, we've got our standees set up, right? Um, I purchased some component kits. One is this. It's called the White Box. It's by Atlas Games. It has all of these nice little components that you can use. You've got little cubes, you've got dice, you've got meeples, you've got coins. You can purchase it um, online. There are other uh, things like this. One I like is the Board Game, board game Design Starter Kit by uh, Gabe Barrett from the Board Game Design Lab. This will give you all the components you need. I spent $100 on these two kits. I have essays on game design. I have a journal. I have tons of components that we can use to get started. But the very first thing is a, a dodgeball game needs to have a board. So I am going to break out my trusty little, um, I'm going to break out a blank game board from the board game design starter kit. 
So we've got the board game uh, game board here. We're going to put a center line on it because in dodgeball, you don't cross the center line, right? So you've got a center line, and then you've got two start lines of dodgeball, right? So your characters need to start at the start line. Okay. Then I think something that would make this really easy because we're using D and D dice. I'm just going to grab trusty dice, which are oh, here we go. Got some great tetrahedral dice here, polyhedral dice. Crack these open. Put them on the table. Okay. So, what do we need to move? Let's see uh, the chat. What, how are you going to move in a dodgeball game? How would you do that? You could do it by player stats, right? So you have cards that you would draft tactically, right? Okay, so you want to move tactically space by space on a grid. How else could you move? Roll dice for distance. I like that. Okay, so let's do this. We are going to have teams, right? And maybe at the beginning of the game, just like in a dodgeball game, you pick your teams, right? So let's get some cards out on the table. Uh, give me a fantasy trope character that we could make into a dodgeball player. Frodo, Aragorn, Knight. Okay, so we got a Knight, Ranger, Hobbit. Hobbit's trademarked, but we all know it just means halfling. All right, so, okay. Um, I like this. I'm seeing some uh, interesting theological ones. We've got a hero king. We've got a Pharisee. Give me another biblical one. Hero king, Pharisee, prophet, seer. Oh, I like that. We've got a seer. Okay. You guys and gals, I just had a breakthrough. This is going to be fantasy dodgeball, where one team is fantasy, classic, and one team is biblical times. So you pick your team. You have a knight, a hobbit, a ranger on one side, and on the other side, you have a hero king, a Pharisee, and a seer. So you have like a religious man, you have a king, you have a, a kind of mystic character. Here you have a knight, a ranger, and a hobbit. Um, Knight and Ranger are kind of similar, right? Let's give them magic. Let's give them, uh, we got, we got range. Let's change the Ranger from, uh, you know, bow and arrow because they're both kind of martial. You've got like a Knight, you've got a Ranger, they're both fighting. Let's change that to a wizard. Sweet. Okay. So now we've got like kind of a magic character on each side. We've got an up close character on each side. And we've got a distance character on each side, right? Okay, so that's kind of interesting. We've got a little bit of balance kind of working out. These players are all going to have different movement dice. So um, the knight and the hero king, they're going to be able to move the most, right? So they should have a better dice to start. So uh, what are the stats that we need in a dodgeball game? We need these characters to have stats so we can organize the board, right? Throw power, dexterity. All right, so we've got to have dodge. Throw, speed. Dodge, throw, speed, help. Okay. Dodge, throw, speed, help. Okay, so what do I have so far? I've got a game board. We've got starting lines. We've got a midway line. Don't cross the midway line. And we've got character cards. So we've got a knight. We've got a wizard, we've got a hobbit, right? So um, here's what we'll do, because you can catch balls and dodgeball. Each of these characters um, will have, they'll have their speed, they'll have their dex, which is both dodge and catch. They'll have their health. So speed, health, dodge, catch, and throw, okay? Each character is going to start with a different dice at each one because these characters all have uh, different abilities. So 
we'll take these tetrahedral dice. We've got like D10s, D20s, D12s. And we'll say, okay, um, uh, what has the best odds for a high roll? A D20, right? You can roll over 10 with 50%. Okay, so our D20 is going to be the player's best ability. Okay, so uh, a knight would have... So let's just take the knight character and let's say, okay, what's his, what's his dice going to be to start? If he's fast, speed, health, dex, throw. Okay, yeah, how about that? Or speed, health, throw, dex, maybe, right? He's going to be not the best dodger or something like that. Speed D4 because of plate mail. Ooh, that's kind of an interesting idea. But David, like if David's your hero king, right? He's not wearing plate mail. He's dressed as himself. He knows who he is, right? So he's just wearing his, his little cloak. Okay, so uh, 20 is going to be speed for the knight. Um, uh, health is going to be the next highest one. That'll be our D12. Our D10 is going to go into throw. And then dex is going to be our D6. Okay, so here's what you have. You have a player card that looks kind of like this. On the, the fantasy side, or on the, um, the biblical side, your hero king is going to be the fastest player. He's going to have the highest chance for health. He's going to have a throw, and he's going to have a dodge that's pretty low. So his dodge is low. Now, here's the thing. We could develop a dozen teams, but we're doing Getmo right now. So you could have different hero kings where all of them have high speed but you could adjust them for different abilities right so you have david he's obviously going to be able to throw better right okay so um okay so we get the idea of like the side the the distance um now what we need to do on our board is we need to have uh um we need to have movement right we need to have movement squares so we have our player cards. We're going to put those off on the side. We're going to divide the board into, and let's just say D6s. Five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There you go. You got your movement. We need some player avatars. So let's just take this big old bag of meeple here. We're going to need, need meeples to move around on the board. Okay, so we've got our cards. We've got our board. We've got our D&D dice. We're putting all of those things to use, okay? As you win games or eliminate players, you get to upgrade a dice on one of your characters. How's that sound? Your character knocks out a character. You get to upgrade one of your stats to the next dice. You've gotten better. You level up, right? So. If your hero king, who is normally using a throw of d10, knocks out a player who has um, uh, knocks out a player with his throw, he can upgrade one of those to the next dice up. He can move his d6 to a d8, for instance, or he can bump his throw up from a d10 to a d12. Okay, so there we go. We're getting this started. We've got our players on the board. They can start anywhere on the start line, so they can be right next to each other or they can fan out more. Probably your wizard you want to keep off on the side. You want to put your hero king right up front. Okay, so just like dodgeball, these players, so you see that? You see that, that board right there? We have a dodgeball game set up between biblical characters and fantasy characters. They have their stats. They have their dice. We just need to measure distance when they throw, and we'll take fuzzy dice. We just need some little balls of foam. I could go get cotton swabs from upstairs. I have cotton swabs in my bathroom. I could pick those up. As long as I'm measuring the correct distance, I throw a fuzzy dice at that player. If I knock him over, we're adding a dex element here. If I knock him over, that player is out, right? Or if I have, uh, maybe the fuzzy dice are just a gimmick. Here's what we do. It's all tactical combat, right? So you're measuring the distance. If you throw, you hit, you do a certain number of damage, depending on your, uh, uh, depending maybe on, let's see, you got your throw, your damage, your health. Yeah, so you throw your dice. If you knock out that character, you drop his health to zero, you as the player get to throw the fuzzy dice at him and knock him out. It's just for fun. It's just a little additional thing there. 
Okay, so here's the thing. This is a game that we could play. I could sit down with you, Donnie, right? You're another tabletop designer with me. We could sit down, we can play, and we can workshop this. This isn't perfect, but get mo, right? We've got players with stats. We've got a dice rolling mechanic. We've got a level to, we've got an ability to level it up. And we've got this cool little other component, these fuzzy dice, that just gives you something fun to do in the game. You're thinking like, when am I going to get to use my fuzz dice to knock down one of these characters? Okay. Yeah, Donnie, let's get together. Let's make it. Okay. Um, that's it. Listen, I rambled on at the beginning of this talk for about 30 minutes, telling you all about me and what it's like to design games. We came up with an idea together as a community, and we have a game on the table. And you know what? I could sit down with my wife tonight and say, hey, let's play fantasy dodgeball that I developed at the Christian Game Developers Conference with all my friends. That's what we're doing. So I want you to feel inspired in this talk. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to go out there. I want you to get mo. And I want you to think about the disciples when Jesus ascended into heaven. He gave them the Great Commission. And they were like, what do we do? And the angel said, get out there do it. Okay, that's it for me. Um, I'm going to take some Q&A. So let's look at um, the top questions here. So I'm just going to show the top questions that have been upvoted. As we keep working in Q&A, um, uh, uh, I'll, just, I'll just answer the, the top voted questions here. So hmm. I'm, I'm not seeing an option to show them to you. So here's what, oh, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah, nice. Okay, so is your game available anywhere on the web for purchase? If not, please provide a link where anyone interested can find more information or follow your journey. Thank you for your interest, Michael. I really appreciate that. Um, I am going to drop in the chat a, a link to my uh, landing page. On my landing page, you will find um, a sign up for email. You can join my Facebook group there. Um, Sorry, I just dropped that in Q&A, but here it is in the chat. That's uh, New Kingdom Gaming. If you're interested in joining, you can join us there. Um, also, I'll throw out a Discord link if you all want to join me on Discord. Um, let's see. I'll make this I'll make this evergreen so you can join whenever you want. And invite link. It expires never. Because I want you all to join me on Discord. So I'll toss this out there. Okay, if you're interested in following along on what I'm doing on New Kingdom, if you want to get involved in the process, help me with art. I'm doing a lot of art development right now. If you really use your guys' input, that would be awesome. Okay, but let's get to the session at hand. What tactics did you use to balance a master's program, family, friends, time with Jesus, and your creative endeavors? 24 hours seem like they aren't enough. Oh my goodness. Brittany, great question. Gitmo is how I did it. <laughs> Gitmo is how I did it. I, I'm, I, I'm, telling you the truth. The reality is, man, um, I want to read stories to my daughter at night. And if I'm going to read stories to her at bedtime, my work has to be done by 7 p.m. when she's going to bed. So the reality is, if I'm working on a sermon, if I'm working on a game design, if I'm working on an email, I have exactly enough time to get it done before bedtime with Ruby. So I have to train myself and get my I have to say, you know what, this sermon could be better but it is where it's going to be this Sunday. Um, and I have to ask Jesus for his grace with that and for his help with that. One of the pro one of the, the, the things is Gemma. The other thing for balance that I think is really important is ordering the desires of your heart. St. Augustine said that our, our sin is all just disordered desire. And I think when you have those, those, uh, those things properly ordered in your life, you'll see that there's, there's a clear... Um, there's a clear order of importance. Here's the thing. I'm marketing a board game. If I don't get my marketing email out uh, bi-weekly on Wednesday, you know, it's okay. Because the thing is, it's important to me, but prepping the sermon for church is more important. And even more important than that is ensuring that my family is well taken care of. So I have this clear order of importance, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm there for bedtime. I'm working on my sermons and my church work. I'm working on my game design. And if it if it falls to third place for that day, that's okay. I always have tomorrow, right? So 
Gitmo and ordering your priorities can help with both of those things. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. I'm going to start a table after this talk. So if you want to talk more about balance, I'd be happy to join you there and, and uh, chat about what balance looks like in your life and how you can achieve that. Um, how did your baby affect your ability to work on the game? <laughs> Two ways. There's a, there is a um, negative or constructive way and a positive way. The, the negative way is it takes time. Um, like being Ruby's dad is a calling that was placed on me by God, right? So like she was given to me, I'm like, if someone's going to be your dad, it's me, right? I have to fill that role. So I have to do that. I have to make time for it. I have to know what those time parameters are. Um, it helps me with time management, but it also pushes me to be better about time management. I say, look, I have a cutoff for work at five. Here's something my wife and I are actually doing right now. That's really helpful. My wife needs more sleep than I do. We're just kind of naturally wired that way. We need to spend time together. She is my partner in everything. So I have a work day that ends at five. I have family time that ends at nine. Lindsay goes to bed and I have more work time after that from 10 to midnight. Lindsay gets up earlier with Ruby. I sleep in until about eight and I get started eight to five working. I've got that five to eight family time. I've got that eight to 10 work time and honor the Sabbath. Find that time in your life too, that Saturday or Friday um, where you can sit and be with your family and you can carve out that time and protect it so that you have that, that uh, counted on time in your schedule that is for taking care of yourself, taking care of your family. I say that that's negative, but really it's constructive. Like it just pushed me to be better in time management and exposed my own deficiencies to me, helped me work through things, view it as a growing opportunity. And that's the second thing. Having a daughter is amazing. She's an, an incredible inspiration to me. She pushes me every day to be a better person, to be a better Christian, to be a more authentic disciple, to be a person who is uh, making good on the things that he's doing, right? So I uh, view, Ruby is, uh, she's like my biggest testing ground, right? She's constantly asking, dad, are you really a follower of Jesus? And I get to show her every day. Yeah, actually I am. Uh, I am, I, and I'm demonstrating it to you through this, this way. Um, so how'd the baby affect your ability to work on the game? She helped me get really serious about my time management, but also she inspires me to be more authentic to who God has called me to be. Um, Okay, second, uh, next question here. Board games are traditionally the board tokens, et cetera. There's a growing blend of traditional board games and digital peripherals. What's your take on this? What comes to mind about this? Uh, so I think what you're getting at, Michael, is a little bit of um, like AR, right? So augmented reality or app-based games. Uh, one that comes to mind is Among Us. Among Us took over app-based, um, a game that... Uh, um, you know, there are all kinds of games like this. You can join from your phone or you can play digitally or you can scan elements of the board and play them on apps and mobile. I think that it's great. Um, I think all of this is fun. Thinking about new components is, is awesome. Um, what I would say uh, is for the creative process, you want to build stuff up and expand the borders. You want to say, okay, uh, not just fantasy, but fantasy dodgeball. Not just dodgeball, but fantasy dodgeball. You know, you get um, these expanding ideas. And I think at some point you have to narrow in on a focus. You have to say, okay, well, what are we really doing with this game? Why is this game unique or special? And then you can start to whittle things away, right? Like we have this dodgeball game. The fuzzy dice is cool. We should maybe use that more, right? We'll really focus in on the fuzzy dice, but we'll only know until people start playing it. They say, I can't wait to throw my fuzzy dice at characters. We say, okay, well, how do we make that happen more? Maybe we need to get rid of some elements, like we need to get rid of dice rolling or drafting, but we need to focus down on that thing. And I think uh, the answer is put it in there and play test it. You have an idea for a unique component, try it out with people in real life and see how it goes. You have an idea for a mobile crossover, build it and see what happens. You know, you have an idea of like, maybe this trivia game would actually be better on a mobile app. You start out with paper and you decide to go that way. I was recently chatting with a designer who was developing a tactical combat game. He started paper prototyping and went, you know, I originally thought this would be a good video game, but now I'm thinking this should be a tabletop game. 
it just is more fun that way. Um, so I think uh, add the components and whittle them down later. Right? That's, uh, that's maybe one of my thoughts on it. Another thought that I have on it is um, accessibility. If you can, if you're adding something new, think about how is this expanding the reach of this game to people that might not be able to play it? Um, a really good example is like maybe through AR or mobile, we could reduce language independence or we could have cards read to people who are either not strong readers or English is a second language or you're trying to develop into other languages. I've been thinking about this a lot. How can we make games more accessible? And one of the ways might be actually adding complexity, things like AR, Google Translate, text to talk, all of those kind of ideas. So um, as you're thinking about new components, the real question for me is, does this enhance the gameplay experience? Does it make it more fun? Does it make it more interesting? If you think it does, do it. Add it in, play it with people. That's the other thing. You can't refine things until you start playing it with people and seeing what the reaction is like. Okay, next question. Do we split royalties on fantasy dodgeball? Hmm. I, you know what? Maybe this is a cool idea. Maybe this could be our tabletop community game. <laughs> or maybe something like that. You know, we could do, uh, um, I could develop it. I, I could start a table. We could get some people on it, um, build it up, get some other tabletop designers, maybe a, a video game designer who's interested in taking a mobile or something. We could split royalties or you know what we could do. We could give all the proceeds back to uh, CGDC and say, you know, if we ever take this to market, this is gonna empower our community, build it forward. You know, it's it's nonprofit volunteer. Uh, let's let's build this game together and let's uh, let's let's take it. Um, okay, so splitting royalties. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. How do you stay motivated halfway through developing slash designing a game? How do you stay motivated halfway through developing slash designing a game? This is a great question. This is actually um, this is a question that I'm going to use the opportunity to dig into theology as we wrap up. Our motivation as Christians is glorifying God, right? That's the question you should ask yourself. Does this game further my discipleship and build the kingdom? Um, use that as motivation. Let that push you forward. Think about the Great Commission. Think about the spread of the gospel. Think about the work that you're doing in your life. Like, is this is this developing something in you? And it could be furthering your discipleship just by teaching you discipline. Could be furthering your discipleship by making you more gentle and easy to receive feedback. It could be furthering your discipleship by um, making you more patient or helping you with time management or giving you an outlet for service. The question for me always when I'm stuck on something is, how do I grow as a disciple of Christ? And I think that can motivate us through most things, right? So you have a family and you hit a rough patch. You go, yeah, but my family is the primary training ground for my discipleship, so I need to care for it, right? Or you're working on a, a friendship and it seems particularly difficult. And you say, yeah, but like this friendship glorifies God or there's something beautiful there. You dig in and you keep working. I think Paul says it well in Galatians 6. I think it's 610 is the verse, but it's definitely in chapter 6. He says, uh, do not grow weary in doing good. For if we continue without giving up, we will reap a harvest at the right time. And so I want to just close with that idea. How do you stay motivated? Um, ask Jesus's help. And so consider how am I walking with Christ and can this move me deep into that walk? Um, I want to give you a blessing as we go on here. Um, and it comes out of Second Thessalonians. So here's my blessing to you, designers. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. In every good work and word. Keep working on your game. Keep pushing forward. And may I glorify God. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for playing along and building the prototype. This was a lot of fun. I look forward to seeing you all in the lounge and in later sessions um, and uh, just to networking with you. If you would, um, you know, follow me on Discord, uh, follow me on uh, um, my website in various ways. Um, and uh, it would be great to, uh, to connect with all of you in real life or in private. So um, if any of you have questions, always available, happy to help out as I can. So thank you so much. God bless you. 
and uh, may he uh, may he work good works in you.